welcome to the Acts of the Apostle. My name is Todd Gale. I'm the Director of Faith Formation. I'm Angel Kirkle, Coordinator of Sacramento Prep. And I'm Claire DeWitt, Youth Faith Formation. And we are going to walk through just for the next few weeks, as long as we're able, as long as we can. We'll just walk through the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. Um, we'll start off with a really quick prayer. It'll be very short. We'll pray the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's get started. So the Acts of the Apostles is the first book after the Gospels. And we begin, um, how about Miss Angel? Could you read a couple lines? Yeah. And then we're going to take you back. You want to take us back to Luke? In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commandment through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Stop. Okay. okay. <laughs> if, you'll, if you've got your Bible handy, we're going to jump back to the Gospel of Luke for just a second and see how that begins. And it begins with the dedication to Theophilus. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things which have been accomplished among us, just as they were delivered to us by those whom from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, mm -hmm. that you may know the truth concerning the things of which you have been informed. So when Luke writes his gospel, there already have been other writings and other stories, other traditions that have been spread throughout. And so Luke is investigating, right? He's gonna, he's gonna dig into it. He uses where it says, followed all things closely. There actually is a Greek word where we get the, the English word autopsy. He performs an autopsy of the facts. Isn't that cool? Because Luke is a doctor, so he uses the doctor terms. He uses physician terms. He followed all things closely. He investigated closely. And what he's talking about, he talks about us. Luke is part of a community. And that's a huge part of what we want to talk about, that we are entering into a community that's different than others, different than other communities. And in this community, we all have a mission. We have a role to play. And we're given the power to do that. Awesome. <laughs> really, really exciting. Awesome. But but why is it so important that we look back at Luke's gospel when we're talking about the book of Acts? Because St. Luke says, both in, in the gospel of Luke and in the Acts of the Apostles, um, he, he's writing to O. Theophilus. So we get the impression this is the same author. Oh, Luke okay. wrote, so Luke wrote both. both. Gotcha. Yeah, right. the gospel according to St. Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. So Acts of the Apostles is like the second installment in the Marvel series of... The sequel. The Just sequel. say the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the sequel. And had Luke continued living and had um, St. Uh, uh, Paul continued living, he might have written the third, the trilogy, but he never got that far, as far as we know. Um, but he's writing to a gentleman named Theophilus. And what is that name? Theophilus mean? Angel, the word person. Theophilus means lover of God. Theo is, is God and Philio is love. So it literally means lover of God. Mm -hmm. So there's a great text note in our study Bible that says this Theophilus was otherwise unknown in early sources. He may be some sort of distinguished figure, some sort of high ranking official, probably a Roman official because of that, his excellency. The, the way that's kind of um, worded. And um, it's, he's also mentioned in, 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 the, uh, in the book of Acts. But what is that word, Theophilus? So if we take it out of a historical sense and apply it, what do you think about Theophilus? Lover of God. Mm -hmm. What does that make you think of, Miss Claire? I mean, thinks of like a disciple or of a Christian. Jesus to the end, or who, who wants to follow Jesus, you know, so. Amen. Yeah. So it may not just be this historical figure of Theophilus. Yes. He might be writing. To all of us. To, to all, all of us, us. right? How oh, awesome. Are you a lover of God? Are you a Theophilus? Mm -hmm. 
We hope so. So that's one of the, the ways that we'll look at scripture. We, we take a very literal, sort of a historical first century look, but then we want to apply it, right? We want to ask, how is God acting, asking us to act? How, how do we apply it? Yeah, sure. Right? So in that first book, so now we're back in the, in the, the book of Acts. In that first book, oh, Theophilus, um, he recorded what Jesus began to do and teach. That implies in this one, we're going to see how that continues. That doing and that teaching is going to continue through the Spirit-filled people, through the Spirit-filled community. This is so consistent, too, with what Jesus would say during his ministry where he says, when the, the advocate comes, you know, talking about his Holy Spirit, you will go on to do the things and even greater mm-hmm. that I do. And so this is so consistent with what Jesus said, too, where it, the story doesn't just end once Jesus rises from the dead, because that's just a new beginning. And so I love that he is taking us there, like, right away and saying, this is, there's more to the story. There's more that, that Jesus did even after the resurrection and after his passion. And who is it that's called to do these things? Well, in verse 2, we read, or Miss Angel read, mm-hmm. the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. is, uh, is the, the agent that's kind of working here, right? right. Through the apostles mm-hmm. whom he has chosen. Mm-hmm. Let's do some more word, word study. A disciple is? A student. A student. Probably. An apostle is? One who's sent. One who's sent. And what we're, what we're going to find is, are the apostles, typically we think of the 12, the big guys, Peter and the boys, right? But there are more than, <laughs> there, there are more, it's a band name. There are more than just those 12. We're going to see in a minute, there are two others that we've never even heard of in scripture before that are brought up. And they also were eyewitnesses. They also had walked among these 12. So it's not just the 12 that are apostles and that are disciples. We know in the other gospel stories, there's Mary Magdalene, yeah. there's uh, Mary, 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 and Mary. <laughs> there's <Another> Ma- band. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, yeah. um, Joanna, Susanna. I'm trying to think of others. Those are a lot of women. Um, tons of other folks. He kept them fed. He kept them going. Yeah. yeah. And so, but there is a, there is within that group of those that are sent, all of us are sent. Amen. To some degree, right? All of us are baptized priests, prophet, king, mm-hmm. and we have a mission. But for some, there's this specific role, mm-hmm. this clerical role, mm-hmm. this um, Jesus sacramental role that is a little different. And those are the capital A apostles. Do you want yeah. to speak to that at all? Or? I don't know. Okay. Do I? <laughs> I, know. I just think about like that idea of we're all we all have that general mission right but then the there were some that were commissioned you know like there's that idea of oh, setting good. apart and saying this is part of your identity this is part of your role amongst the the general call to be sent for sure. that's great and and according to saint john paul the great who we, we love to talk about right. um those that are called to this role this clerical call this commission are meant to serve the other apostles right. that are going out on mission right they're to serve to feed the foot soldiers, mm-hmm. so to speak, right? Sacramentally. Mm-hmm. Um, so in one sense, here he's talking in one sense about the 12 apostles. Right. But he's also, we're going to see that there are more gathered. We're going to see in a couple of verses there are 120 people that are gathered together. Um, and he has chosen them. He has elected Ooh. It's really important. I love the idea that you individually, you are chosen to be part of this band of of crazy disciples, right? (laughs) We're in this together, sorry. (laughs) Right? And we're chosen for this by him, by Jesus himself. Anything else on that? I just think about... um, like we were talking about applying it, right, and how is this lived out in your own lives. Um, you just think about the crazy band of people that Jesus called, right? They come from all different types of backgrounds, all types of different experiences, right, different 
growing up and livelihoods and that type of thing. And yet, like, nothing would have made that work except Jesus, mm-hmm. right? And so, like, they're, they're, them being chosen was so strategic, right? And I think about in my own life and, like, I think about in ministry, right? And there have been so many times that I've been in a room <laughs> and I've seen all the people gathered there and I'm like, how is this going to work, <laughs> you know? Because they're all, they're all so different. They all come from different stories, different backgrounds. And in any other circumstance, I would have been like, nope, this is just, let's just let this die right now, right? <laughs> but because we're all there and we have, you know, like that sense of call and that sense of being sent, right, and that hunger and thirst for God, it works. And it works weirdly well, right? Yeah. And so it's just so cool to see something that Jesus started 2,000 years ago, like, still happens now it's, it's still a reality now and we, that's because the holy spirit doesn't have the expiration date you know yeah. like, only through the holy spirit yeah exactly so there, i mean i can't tell you how many times i've gone into a room like okay like n- not knowing what's going to happen right because there's just so many different personalities that are in the room or so many different people that have you know different things bringing bringing in that the other person in the room might not understand but because the holy spirit is present it works even folks very opposite, or even what well, they would normally be enemies in right. the outside world. Yeah. Uh, among Jesus' followers, we have a Jewish turncoat tax collector. Right. Yes. With a zealot who is like, like, right. you know, the liberation <laughs> army for, for for Judaism that right. wants to kill all the Romans. Yeah. And these yeah. guys are sitting at table together. And eating together. Eating. And living together. Yeah. And they end up giving their lives together. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, and then there's. The folks that think, I'm not good enough. Oh, oh, oh. If you think that, (laughs) he's got a call on you, right? Right, That's when you're specially chosen. I'm not good enough because of my past. You don't know my past. Right. Well, Jesus does know your past. Amen. And those are the folks he chooses. I mean, oh my gosh, look at us. (laughs) You don't even know our story. You don't know (laughs) And you don't want to. Talk about a ragtag group of apostles. (laughs) So Jesus, um, the, so, so uh, uh, St. Luke says, Theophilus, he's, he's writing this to him. Um, he's setting the stage that this is about the Holy Spirit's work. Right. The Holy Spirit is going to do some work here. Yeah. And in verse 3, he says, To them, to these apostles, he presented himself alive after his passion by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking of the kingdom of God. What were the many proofs that Jesus gave that he was who he said he did, or he was who he says he was? The first one is the resurrection. Amen. I mean, that's not the first, but in this context, he rose from the dead. That was kind of like a little bit of proof. (laughs) Just a a little bit. Just a little bit of proof. And then what did he do? How did he appear to them? In the next 40 days. Well, I mean, we just had the gospel reading the other day, right, of the Road to Emmaus story. Uh, one of my favorites. Me too. You know, so he shows up to these two wayward guys walking along the Road to Emmaus, and he unveils the whole old scripture to them, which, mm-hmm. I mean, best Bible study in history, right? Mm-hmm. So he walks through the whole Old Testament story, talking about what points to himself, and they don't even know it's him. And then they get to this room, and he shares bread with them and they recognize him in the breaking of the bread right so in the breaking and the blessing and the sharing of the bread they realize who he is that's so amazing and then he disappears yeah not only does he rise from the dead which is pretty awesome in and of itself but then he just vanishes out of thin air and that was like easter night that's easter night yeah that's the first easter night and then whether it was a day or two later he pops into the room (laughs) <laughs> Doubting Thomas. Yeah. With, yeah, yeah. with the boys that are yeah, gathered that, there and, and the other disciples. That's also on the first Easter. Is that the first day yeah, also? Yeah. yeah. All of his all of the things in scripture um, where he appears to the apostles after his resurrection are always on a Sunday. Oh uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's so right. You go through and you first look day of the week. <laughs> yeah, it's always the first day of the week. That's cool. So he appears also to the the twelve, but Thomas wasn't in the room at the moment. Right. Thomas comes back into the room, and this is that beautiful scene where he says, I won't believe it unless I can actually touch the wounds, right? And Jesus says, okay, dude, come here. (laughs) Come here. He presents them in his glorified body, and I think that itself is another proof, right? Because what man who endured that type of 
beating and torture and withstand so many injuries to be able to turn around three days later and be like glowing practically right, right? yeah radiating right and to have those those wounds be be present but yet still healed um just mm-hmm. like the miracle of of his body his, itself right And Mary Magdalene right. talked to him. She thought yep. he was the gardener. Yep. It's a very bizarre scene. We'll talk about that another time. <laughs> I love that story. Um, St. <laughs> Paul mentions in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, St. Paul says, if you don't believe us, there are 500 other brothers and sisters yes. who saw the resurrected Christ. Right. Whoa. Right. So, so these, he had proofs and he appeared to them over 40 days. Now what's, 40 days to a good Jewish boy or girl, <laughs> Miss Angel, the Jewish expert among us. Well, in scripture, 40 is always a number um, of a couple of things, trial, testing, um, preparation. preparation, yeah. So it's always symbolic of, of going through a time of change and a time of preparation and a time of testing for something new. So we right. saw like... 40 days of rain with the story of Noah's Ark. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. What else are there? 40, 40 days. 40 years. 40, 40 years in the desert. 40 years in the desert. That was a yeah. lot of change and a lot of preparation. <laughs> they needed it, though. Yeah. I read not long ago in Jewish commentaries, it'll say it's roughly 40 weeks, isn't it, for gestation of a human? Yeah. Isn't that, yeah. that kind of cool? That's like a Jewish commentary. Oh, it, is, it is 40 weeks. Yeah. It's about 40 it's weeks. Not, it's not actually nine months. It's 40 weeks. So isn't that cool? Yeah. So That's there's awesome. th- that Time number for, and then Jesus takes 40 days in the desert mm-hmm. to prepare. It's over Moses over spends 40 days up on the mountaintop mm-hmm. with, with the Lord. And he gets the Ten Commandments. Yeah. 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 So it's it's kind of a Jewish, it's like an alarm that goes off. 40 days, oh, that means he's preparing. Yeah. He's, he's getting them he's ready. He's getting them ready for something right. different, something new. Well, what's going to be different? Well, St. Luke will tell us this. Um and in verse 4, and while staying with them, very interesting, some translations say while eating with them, mm. while he stays at <laughs> table with them. I just think that's really cool. He, why is that so funny? It's not. Because I like to eat? <laughs> no. <laughs> no we, we were just like, mm, yes. <laughs> Both at the same time. Oh, that's great. So he charts them not to depart from Jerusalem. This is really huge but to wait for the promise of the Father, Mm -hmm. which he said, you heard before me. For John baptized, which you heard from me before. John baptized with water, but before many days, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I want to talk about those three things. Waiting for the promise, um, uh, uh, the gift of the Father, Mm -hmm. and baptized in the Holy Spirit. Which one do you want to talk about? I'll talk about the gift of the Father. I okay. love that. The gift of the Father. Yeah. Um, what well, is that? something that I just, I really love is right after, we were talking about kind of that bizarre interaction that Jesus had with Mary Magdalene, right after he rises from the dead, and Mary thinks that Jesus is a gardener. And after Jesus reveals his identity to her, and she realizes who this is, he says, go and, and tell my brothers that I'm going to my father and their father. Right? It, it's very like clear that this idea of, of Jesus going back to the Father is not just part of his identity anymore, but it's part of ours as well. Ooh, um, awesome. And that's so, great. I mean, that's, and that was kind of part of, not kind of, it was part of Jesus's whole point in ministry, right? What is the prayer that he teaches us? Our Father. Right. This is such a main message of, of what Jesus wants to communicate is that God is our Father. And that fatherly identity is not one that's supposed to be just this like wispy thought, right? But something concrete and something real and something that we're not, we're supposed to make part of our identity. And that is such a gift, right? Because that's not, when we think about a father, right? Jesus even says in his gospels, you know, what good father would hand his son a scorpion when he asks for a fish, right? That relationship with God where instead of having to barter with him, beg or plead or only like, oh, if I just gave enough sacrifice or I just did enough of this, then God would be on my side. Or, oh, I've sinned so much and that's why my son is blind. You know, that kind of give and take relationship that they were viewing with God at that time. And instead, Jesus comes and he wants to flip that all around and say, no, God is a good father. And this is how I want you to relate to him. And 
so it's so mm. consistent with how That's then great. he appears later on. So That's amazing. Yeah. So not only is are we waiting that promise of the Father, yeah. but he says he wants us to stay put. Mm -hmm. Don't depart from Jerusalem. You want me to talk about that? Sure. Or do you want to talk about Go that? Go for it. Um, because he's got this power source that he's going to give them. And one of the, the important things that, that I've learned, I don't do this well, <laughs> don't jump and move until you take time to pray first. Yeah. Wait until mm -hmm. you're plugged into the power source, mm -hmm. right? One of my favorite stories about how that acts out um, very really in, in our diocese, when a, a good, good friend of ours, Craig Pohl, was hired um, by the bishop to be the director of evangelization for the Diocese of Lansing, the first year that he had this job, Bishop said, I don't want you doing any like projects. For a year, I want you to pray. I want you to seek the Lord's heart. I want you to call on the Holy Spirit. I want you to meet with people and get a get a sense, a pulse of where is the Holy Spirit moving in the diocese. Ah, that is awesome. Right? Don't move until you've got the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, and Bishop did that himself, right? When he put out that apostolic letter um, that he put out, gosh, what's it been, eight years ago now? It's been a but while. But he spent the year before that praying, and we all did too. Remember when we prayed, come Holy Spirit, at the end of every Mass for a year? That was part of Bishop's year of prayer right. prior right. to sending out that letter. Right. Um, wow. Which is just awesome. So, again, it's like, Jesus is, like, he's not just making it up as he goes. There's so much intentionality between everything that he's doing, right? Because there's the promise of, of the Father, and then it's this idea of being united with the Father in prayer, right? It's, it's going to him and, and saying that that's the first thing, right? It's not about what we do. It's not, it's, it's not an identity of doing. It's an identity of being. And so awesome. when we're plugged into that, then and, everything flows from that. And the promise of that flows all through Scripture, mm -hmm. right? Amen. That promise of the Father. It mm -hmm. goes way back, way more than we want to spend time with. Or have time doing. to spend. Because <laughs> um, today we'll, we're almost done for today. <laughs> Already, we barely got through anything. Um, it's the way so, we do Bible study. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit, or, or, or God has told them, stay put. Wait until the power comes. Wait until you get your marching orders. And the promise of the Father is coming upon you. But he says, um, uh, and you, you heard about this before from me. For when John baptized with water. But before many days, you will be <laughs> baptized with the Holy Spirit. Ooh, ooh, ooh. What does that mean? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, we baptism of the sacrament of baptism, we rightly think of when we hear that word, right? But. The word baptism just means to be immersed in, to, to have have it flowing through you completely, right? Um, so when we hear the words baptized with the Holy Spirit, you should be immersed in the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. as they will be immersed with the Holy Spirit and just be completely infused with the Spirit. Plunged. Plunged into, I love that. Can you imagine being plunged into the power of the Holy Spirit? Yes, we hope you can imagine, because that's the normative response right. in a Christian life, right? That's, I mean, like, when, we, when we're at Mass, or even watching Mass these days, right, when Father holds up that chalice and, and says those words of consecration of, this is my blood of the new covenant, right, my personal prayer at that time is always just to be flooded with the Holy Spirit through that. Mm -hmm. Isn't that awesome? Just totally be immersed in it. So three times in the first eight verses, the name Holy Spirit mm -hmm. comes up. This is the book of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, there's Amen. one commentator, I forget who it was, I stole, <laughs> said this should be titled, The Lord Jesus Christ at Work by the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. Yes, that's a and much it, better name. <laughs> it's really not the acts of the Apostles. Really, the Apostles themselves are only in the first few chapters. Uh -huh. It's really going to follow a, a travel log with St. Paul. It's really going to focus on him. And he is an Apostle, right. but not one of the original. Right. Not one of the original 12 or 11. Well, again, bringing it back to what does this have to do with us today, right? It's not the act of the person of the priest who consecrates or baptizes or does any of the other sacramental actions that he does. Is it's really the act of the Holy Spirit through him. 
Mm -hmm. right? So just as in this, it's not really the acts of the apostles, it's the acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. And it's not just the acts of the 12 apostles, right. or the 12 plus uh, Paul. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it includes us. Right. Amen. Amen. We are included in, in that apostolic succession that we've talked about so many times before. So I hope this has wet the whistle, so to speak. I hope this has get, gotten you intrigued to read on. Um, scripture, in one sense, is always about what it's writing about as far as that time period, the people right. it involves, but it also is always written for us, too. Mm -hmm. So how can we pray this? So what we want to do is we pray through these scriptures. We take them to heart. We pray. We ponder them. We think about them. Put yourself in the scene. Use your imagination. Mm -hmm. um, and have some fun with it and wrestle. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. Amen. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very mysterious. Sometimes it's very hard. <laughs> Sometimes it'll make you angry. That's all right. Let it make you angry. Yeah. Wrestle with it. Yeah. It's okay. God can handle it. Mm -hmm. Amen. So we'll end our very first session. We pick up next time we meet in verse 6. We only got through five verses. That's okay. Is that right? Yeah. Um, we didn't even talk about the ascension of Jesus yet. That had the, That's still back in the Gospel of, <laughs> of Luke. <laughs> we haven't even started anything. We're just doing the intro, but we'll have fun with this. So thanks, everybody. Um, we love you. We miss you so very much. And let's end, as we always do, in a very short prayer. <laughs> All glory be to, to the Father, Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Bye. 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 Bye.